it's good to see you, Lisa. And um, how would how, what, what message do you take from Amex right now? How much do you like this stock? I love Amex right now. It's one of our top picks, uh, mainly because it traded off some over the last six weeks, sort of in sympathy with the uh, the media, you know, the mid-sized bank uh, crisis. But actually, if anything, they might be an opportunistic beneficiary from that, you know, as they pick up some incremental business with small businesses, one of their core segments. But their results this morning were remarkably strong. Build business up 16 percent year on year, revenues up 23 percent. And it's really being driven by strength in the consumer, particularly their millennial Gen Z cohorts, continued recovery in travel, which was up 30% year on year, as well as their international segments, which are still recovering post-pandemic, which were also up nearly 30% year on year. So, uh, you know, a really strong uh, result out of Amex, with the exception, of course, of expenses, which surprised um, a bit. Uh, coming in a little bit elevated, and so as a result, put a little bit of pressure on the stock today. Lisa, I don't know if you caught all of that discussion we were just having. It, it wasn't very um, upbeat, <laughs> you know. Maybe unless there's some Fed rate cuts to come. Well, but when you listen to that, what do you think? As somebody who's also very dialed into what we're hearing from some of these stocks that are also on the front lines of trends in the U.S. economy. Yeah, what I'd say is, look completely understood that some of the early indicators like the manufacturing indexes, et cetera, that they were highlighting are starting to look shaky. But from where I sit in payments land, staring at the consumer very carefully, so far, because employment has remained healthy and because the balance sheets remain strong, consumers, particularly the affluent consumers, are still out there spending. Um, you know, charge off rates, for example, at MX, you know, are up consecutively sequentially to about 1.6%, but they're still well below where they were even pre-pandemic. So just you always have to put that in perspective that that consumer is not just spending, but the balance sheet is actually still quite healthy. So they're hanging in there. So I think I agree with your former guest that if we can navigate this through to, you know, a run of the mill sort of uh, garden variety slowdown um, and not really crater it, then we should be OK. Right. And again, that is a, a big difference, obviously, from the household balance sheet back in 2008. So many other stocks you cover to talk about. You cover IBM. Obviously, we saw what happened there. Um, I can ask you whether time to throw in the towel on Coinbase after everything that they've been through in crypto land, PayPal, buy now, pay later. I guess maybe I'll ask you about buy now, pay later as, as a parting thought. Do you think this is going to become a, a, a defunct uh, business segment at some point, regulatory crack. I mean, you've seen how much this this story about people using it to buy groceries and everything is making the rounds. What, what, what do you sense about that? Yeah, it's a good question. My view is buy now, pay later is a feature. It's not a product. It, these uh, standalone businesses, these businesses um, are w will be difficult to make succeed over the longer term. But as a feature, meaning just embedded in another, you know, consumer lending product, like as part of a credit card product or a debit card kind of plus type of product, uh, providing consumers with this opportunistically, like for specific types of transactions, there's a lot of appeal for it. But usually it's for niche uh, situations, you know, like healthcare, for example, unexpected healthcare expenses or home improvement, uh, kind of unusual big ticket items should not be absolutely for everyday spending. And so understandably, the CFPB is starting to lean in on it pretty heavily. Right. Although Apple is also kind of in, getting into the space. And I, I just feel like they wouldn't do that if they thought that was going to raise a, a host of future problems. Then finally, you mentioned you like Amex here. We've, what else do you think is best positioned in your coverage universe? Yeah, so maybe a little more controversial one, but Block is also one of our absolute top picks. You know, it has traded off in the wake of this Hindenburg short report that came out a few weeks ago, which really held no water, to be honest. And the company came out with a lot of incremental disclosures to refute that. And Block, the key thing to know on Block is we have their uh, uh, adjusted EBITDA figure up over 50% year on year because their margins are improving after wow. they sort of overspent coming out of the pandemic. And that's the number one metric the stock trades on. So we have over 50% upside in the stock this year with no change expected in multiple. It's really just on profit performance. Um, so love that one. It's a pretty uh, sort of idiosyncratic call on block there as they are dialing back their expense growth. I was just, you know, we were talking about this with a different guest the other day, but they were saying, you know, corporate name change always seems like a good sell uh, sign. What if block changed its name back? Bring back Square. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
that's a good point. I know we still all trip over, I think, say the word block, but they kept, they did keep the square brand, you know, on the POS systems for small True. businesses, which continue to do really well. And that's well, and, you know, we'll see how it evolves over time. Increasingly, they're kind of just known as square and then cash app, you know, the digital wallet. That's also very popular. True. Maybe that should be the, uh, the new name for all of it.